Moving towards the Feast of the Ascension and the Pentecost. But before I get into that, I'm dying to dig deeply into our first reading from the book of Acts because there's a lot packed into a very few words that's easy to miss uh, because of all the cultural uh, and social differences between that era and ours. Um, all set in motion by this dream Paul has and what he perceives as the calling to go to Macedonia and preach the gospel. And we get very shorthand mention of the journey from this place to that, to the next, to the other one, and finally landing in Philippi. And that's where uh, things begin to take place. Lydia and her household as um, first to accept the faith in that new town become the epicenter for the Christian movement to spread through the city. Um, and that was fundamentally how they did things. Um, the family that first accepted Christ would become essentially the parish. They would become a house church. And from there things would grow. And the household leader um, would, would be the leader of that church. So Lydia is the leader of that faith community. And from her and her family, her household, the message will go out. And there's some things about this that are really powerful and important for us to notice, especially, as I say, because of the cultural differences. In the ancient world, in Greek culture, women were essentially property. In Roman culture, they had a little bit more status. Someone like Lydia could inherit a business from a father or a husband who didn't leave a male heir, or get into a business through some other channel that would not be tolerated in Greek culture. Um, but her place as head of a business and head of a household is um, not common. And what's even more uncommon or countercultural is that this Christian movement that comes along embraces her as head of the church. The Christian value for equality in Christ, the Christian value for all of us being embraced by God as peers, is that radically different from the world around them in that day. And frankly, even to our own day, we don't have the true equality we talk about. But those are the kinds of things we see in uh, Paul's letters, for example, when he talks about the mystical body of Christ. Each of us embracing a different role, but each one absolutely vital out of equal dignity. Here we've got a picture of the church planting its message, so to speak, in Philippi in a manner that's completely countercultural and yet is a message of freedom and love for all. Now another piece about Lydia and the way she's described that's significant and we could easily miss is that she's noted as being in the business of trading of purple cloth. Purple dye was an extremely scarce and valuable commodity in the ancient world. They made it from tiny little mollusks that lived in the Mediterranean. And it took a lot of them to create enough dye for any significant amount of cloth. So it was extremely expensive, and because of that, a mark of status. So much so that by Roman law, it was dictated who in what social stratum could wear purple cloth, and how much purple cloth they could wear. It was that significant a piece of status. Lydia, because this is her trade, this is her business, has access to levels of Roman society that's unprecedented, to households and servants in households that are highly influential. And it's through these kinds of networks and relationships and connections 
that we see the Christian message go out and spread. And through many different layers of Roman society, it spread so quickly that within the first couple of generations, before the destruction of Pompeii by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, uh, we find Christian graffiti already in the town as, as they've excavated it since then. Uh, the message spread quickly with that powerful, potent message that regardless of what the society around us says about us, we are equally loved, we are equally embraced, we have an equal place in the family of God. In our second lesson, um, John continues describing those visions of the heavenly city, but as is the case in Revelations, a lot of stuff is packed into code words. Uh, much like uh, English satire would criticize the royal family with uh, sideways remarks about things that seem to be nonsensical but are understood, uh, the book of Revelation makes its commentary about the Roman Empire and how God is going to bring justice and put these bad people away. Uh, in this particular passage, John is described as being taken by an angel to see the decaying city of Babylon. Well, the Babylonian Empire died out centuries before this. That's code word. That's Rome. Rome is going to die away and run away. And this vision of the New Jerusalem, the city of God, come down from heaven to fully unite humanity and divinity becomes the new center of all things. And it's powerful and beautiful, the poetic way John describes this, that the glory of God shines through the city in such a way that there's no need for sun or moon or any other light. So filled with God's presence are the people, the inhabitants of the city. Another little tidbit that we wouldn't notice because Again, we don't come from that ancient world. Later on, John will describe the city in a little bit of architectural detail and talk about the city's wall. Well, when you look at that carefully, the wall that John describes is minuscule compared to what would be built in the day. This wall has no military defensive value whatsoever. The city has no enemies. Fears no attack. Love has pervaded the world. Heaven and earth are fully united. In our gospel story, we have a slice from John's telling of the Last Supper story. Jesus preparing his disciples for his death, his final his resurrection, his final departure, which we will celebrate next week with the Feast of the Ascension, and Don will fill us in about that. Um, and then ultimately telling them, you know, be prepared for the Spirit to come. What we call Pentecost, what we know as Pentecost. And really calling them, urging them to be attentive to that Spirit. Listen to that Spirit. That Spirit the Father will send you in my name will teach you all things and remind you of the things that I've said. The implication, of course, is that there's more revelation to come. So tune in, pay attention, listen. I really believe it's important as we move through these last two weeks of our Easter season that we make spiritual preparation to celebrate Ascension and Pentecost, to be prepared to receive and be refreshed and renewed in God's Spirit. Because we are called to live out our Christian vocation and our Christian ethic from that place of God's presence within us. So every one of our acts of charity, of compassion, of striving for justice, of caring for those in suffering and need, ideally should come from that place within us where God dwells. And as I've mentioned many times, God will never force God's self upon us. We must extend the invitation. 
we must metaphorically open the door of our heart and mind and soul and invite God in. And these last two weeks are a perfect time for us to be focused on that together. And I want to invite you to join me in spending these next two weeks praying for the gift of the Holy Spirit, praying for the renewal and refreshment of the Spirit in our lives to empower everything we do as Christians. And I'm going to share you a very simple ancient prayer from Christian monastic and um, mystical tradition. Come, Holy Spirit, kindle in me the fire of your love. Could you repeat that with me, please? Come, Come Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, kindle in me the fire of your love. Take that with you. When you pray at home, add that little message. When it crosses your mind, anywhere about your daily business, gosh, the flowers God gave us out there in the garden of beautiful. Make that clear. When you're about your business and anything at all reminds you of God, make that little prayer. Invite the Spirit to come to refresh you and renew you and reinvigorate you in God's Spirit. And as a community of faith, we will then go forward refreshed, renewed, carrying forward the mission that we've been given, carrying forward the love of neighbor that we've been called to live carrying forward the love of God that we have called. Thank you.